been a whole 10 years and some months since the release of the groundbreaking Avatar, and all these years later, people are still celebrating its brilliance. I'm James Cameron, auteur of the cinematic masterpiece. We're going to revisit the impact that Avatar had on an entire generation. Yeah, I love watching Avatar, but then my bigger TV broke years ago and I can only watch on a smaller screen, so I haven't seen it in a while. Ah, uh, the heavy symbolism and character development was too powerful for you to take in without a larger screen. Uh, yeah. That's it. It's no doubt that Avatar has left its mark with stellar 3D technology, incredible groundbreaking digital advances, and breathtaking visuals as well as its message that haunts and inspires every viewer who is deep enough to understand it. Um, sure. And where do you keep my prize cinematic achievement? Well, my bigger TV is on the fritz, so I've just been using it as a coffee coaster. No doubt adding to your beverage so that you can drink in the deepness of- Sure, yes. But fear not, dear viewers, for there is more on the way. Where I have been spending years writing and directing even more Avatar movies. In Avatar 2, Jake goes missing, so Natiri goes to the human world to find him, and must adapt to its new environment to find her love. Isn't that Pocahontas 2? Huh? I'm pretty sure that's the plot to Pocahontas 2. I saw it as a kid. Never heard of it. But let me tell you about my other sequel. In Avatar 3, several of the Navi's babies are kidnapped by humans, so a team of fierce warriors have to go rescue them but get sucked into Earth's addictive ways. With the help of a little girl who wants to be a circus performer, they- That's Fern Gully 2. Huh? That's the exact story of Fern Gully 2, The Magical Rescue. I know that because I was forced to watch it when I misbehaved. Impossible. I don't even introduce Batty until Act 2. Do you have any original ideas for these flicks? Of course I do. Why, in Part 4, they- What's the plot of Dance with Wolves 2? I should have been an accountant. Avatar. It was nominated for Best Picture, and you can never change that. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy. Remember it so you don't have to. It's practically a cliche to say that Avatar is full of cliches. The incredibly hyped over budget former highest grossing film ever still seems to have the same reaction it did now that it did over 10 years ago. The plot and characters aren't very good, everybody knows it, but nobody cares. Everyone's made the comparisons to Dances with Wolves, Ferngully, and Pocahontas, but to many, Avatar was more of a spectacle than a film. The 3D was unlike anything seen at the time. The entire film being shot in IMAX as opposed to just part of it was rarely seen for big budget films. And the visuals were colorful and grand in scale. Many said it felt like you were really there in a completely different world. You don't judge the story and characters of a roller coaster, you just enjoy the ride. That seemed to be most people, and even critics, reactions. But for a film that took the world by storm, the highest grossing movie of all time for several years, nobody really talks about it. I mean, how many talks have you heard about Star Wars, Marvel, Harry Potter? Tons. But after it left theaters with an impressive eight month run, people stopped talking about it. Think about that, the highest grossing movie for a decade, and people have little passion to discuss it. Whether you like Titanic or not, the former highest grossing movie ever made, everyone had a strong opinion about it, but with Avatar, not so much. So rather than kick a movie while it's kinda down, I wanted to look at the impact and even lack of impact this movie had. I made no secret I wasn't a big fan of this film, but it's interesting to look over what elements are still being utilized years later and what elements aren't. Well, still poking fun of the stupid shit because there's a lot of stupid shit. <laughs> Let's go back to Pandora, or more importantly, Papyrus Font! Ah, Comic Sans' pretentious roommate. Over ten years later, this is... Avatar. The film opens with a paraplegic soldier named Jake, played by British-Australian Southerner Sam Worthington. So a week before Tommy's gonna ship out? Don't. Got this. He was the one who wanted to get shot light years out in space. Figured it's just another hellhole. A guy with a gun ends his journey. They take me to this island where I can kill Creed. No, oh, sorry, that was Hugh Jackman not carrying an X-Men Origins, but it's hard to tell, wasn't it? Waking up in space, heading towards the planet Pandora. 
With compliments to the 3D, I still look at many of these shots and still see them in three dimensions, despite me seeing it only once years ago. In fact, the majority of these shots still look impressively massive because not only is so much kept in focus, but the main subjects are almost entirely in view at the center of the screen, allowing you to take in the scenery while also having something to compare in size. And then, you know, they talk. You are not in Kansas anymore. There's no such thing as an ex-Marine. You may be out, but you never lose the attitude. It is my job to keep you alive. I will not succeed. Okay, the writing in this is by no means the worst, but it's very... Oh, what's the best comparison here? Hot shots. If there is a hell, you might want to go there for some R&R. &R. I don't care how good you think you are! Your ego's writing checks your body can't cash. Me, I'm just another dumb grunt going someplace he's gonna regret. I can never find time for love. Too heavy. It's an anchor that drowns a man. Yeah, yeah. I know who you are, and I don't need you. He's the type of guy that could end up killing every man in this outfit. They sound like cliché dramatic setups for Lloyd Bridges to say something funny to. You got to obey the rules. You're on Pandora. God damn it, Bill. I'm supposed to be in California. These guys were army dogs, fighting for freedom. But out here, they're just hired guns, taking the money. I don't have a clue what you're talking about, Phil. Not a fucking clue. Like I said, though, this isn't the worst. I'd argue it's almost expected for a movie about blue cats fighting mechanical ripoffs of your own ripoffs. And yes, even the lame-ass reason why a soldier with absolutely no knowledge about this species is chosen to be put in the body of one is enjoyably weak. You see, Jake's brother was the one who was gonna do it, but then died. So they sent this guy in only because he has the same genome. Since your genome is identical to his, you could step into his shoes. That's like a football player dying and putting in his brother who has no idea how to play the game because the uniform fit. But again, I feel like most people would be expecting this from a James Cameron script. It's when we get to the company, and yes, that is what Jake calls them. Taking the money, working for the company. The man! Where the head named Selfridge, played by Giovanni Ribisi, doesn't care about the precious life on the planet, he just wants gold. I mean diamonds, I mean oil, I mean... Oh, like it matters, just call it unobtainium. This is why we're here, unobtainium. Yeah, that's actually what it's called, unobtainium. It's like in Pulp Fiction if the item in the briefcase was called the MacGuffin. It's honestly kind of hilarious. Well, lucky your guy had a twin brother, and lucky that brother wasn't some oral hygienist or something. I'm hoping the atmosphere on Pandora can drain my sinuses. If you're like me, this guy and Stephen Lang as the colonel is when you start to put together, this movie's in trouble. Both of them are so comedically one note, even celebrating it in their performances, that Billy Zane from Titanic is looking like Kylo Ren from Star Wars. If you don't take it seriously, it's actually pretty funny. You see that? Yes, sir. No, you didn't. You were looking at the monitor. The Avatar program is a bad joke. Olympic science majors. We build them a school. We teach them English. Learn these savages from the inside. I want you to gain their trust. Well, I think it's about time Rick Edwards from Best Friends did sci-fi. As soon as you see these two, you can already sense that waving finger of guilt getting ready to wag at you. In fact, you can see it in one of the corners, <laughs> waiting to burst out and make you feel bad for not being as enlightened as the movie is. <gasps> not yet. Tim Curry still has to sing Toxic Love. Who's got my goddamn cigarette? It's cool to see Sigourney Weaver in this as the scientist who studies the Navi, but even her performance feels a little, um, Captain Marvel-y. No man, this is such idea. bullshit. I don't even know who I am. I'm gonna kick his corporate butt. He has no business sticking his nose in my department. Your people are terrorists. They kill innocents. I hate saying that, she's such a badass icon, but I think it's similar to Ford in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. She might have been away from this kind of role a little too long and is overcompensating her toughness a bit. Of course, the dialogue doesn't help either. I need your brother. You know, the PhD who trained for three years for this mission? You've been in a coma for 7,300 days. But again, like many people have said, who cares? We just want to see the Na'vi, the natives who are stopping the humans from getting their unobtainium, inhabiting that awesome world. Take it nice and slow, Jake. Good. Okay, well, no trunkal attacks here, that's good. Spock, did we just witness the beginning of a new fetish? Yes, Captain. We witnessed the birth of countless hours of computer-generating Na'vi porn. Ew. Jake is put into the Na'vi avatar, and gee, it's almost like he wasn't properly prepared for any of this. Jake, we're not supposed to be running! <laughs> His chart says he has way too much free spirit. He might even be- Don't say it! A dreamer. Oh! 
they go out into the jungles of Pandora, and I'll admit, I remember the effects being a little distracting because the Na'vi were just so silly looking to me, but now that I look back, these are very good effects. To give you an idea of how well they held up, this is Justice League. It's only three years old and looks like this. Hell, Cat is less than one year old and it looks like this. Avatar is over 10 years old and looks like a movie that was released today. Yes, there's naturally some scenes that don't hold up as well, but seeing this on a smaller screen, I know it's gonna sound odd, but it actually showed me how well the effects held up. On IMAX, you're distracted by the size, the 3D, the unusual visuals, but on a smaller screen, you notice more how well everything blends together. Oh, and you know, there's characters in a plot, I guess. <laughs> Don't shoot those, the Na'vi shit those out! They come across a giant beast, but Jake seemingly scares it off. That's right, get your punk ass back to mommy. Yeah? Yeah, you got nothing, you keep running. Yeah, we're already stealing from a ton of kids' media, why not steal from Beethoven as well? With a dash of Jurassic Park. <laughs> Jake is separated from his team, but is discovered by tasteful Cyboob getting ready to take him out. No! Grandma Jellyfish Willow senses good in him! And this Cheerios Beast Blue should scare away any predators. <laughs> He's saved by Natiri, played by Zoe Zaldana. Hmm, <laughs> this shouldn't be turning me on. Thank God it isn't. And she mocks his survival skills. You're like a baby. Making noise, don't know what to do. Hey, don't talk about the director like that. Thana! He had one day until retirement! Seeds of the sacred tree, very pure spirits. Yeah, they never did that for Weaver, who literally dedicated her entire life saving them, but you're Neo! You're just the one because you're the one. Isn't it nice being born important? What was that all about? Come. That was come? Christ, I knew it felt sticky and reproductive! So because the tree seaman picked him as the messiah, Natiri takes him to her clan. Who ride more Jurassic Park ripoffs? <laughs> oh, and see if this sounds familiar. Natiri is the daughter of an old chief, is betrothed to a stern, angry warrior, and may have eventual feelings for our lead outsider. What are you called? John Smith. I mean, the blob guy from Fern Gully. I mean, name an after school special with trees, and I'm the main guy in that. They decide to show him their ways because he's a soldier, and I guess they trust them more than scientists. Again, how long was Weaver with them? And Atiri is tasked with showing him how they live. He sleeps in their tamales and wakes up back at base. Look, Sully, Sully, just find out what the blue monkeys want. Uh, I believe they prefer the term turquoise monkeys. We tried to give them medicine, education, roads, but no, 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 they like mud. Metaphor, metaphor, metaphor. Don't worry, Finger, they'll catch on to our subtlety. Hey, can, you, can somebody just... Sector 12. He tells Jake that their village around Disney's Animal Kingdom tree has the largest amount of unobtainium, and it's his job to get them to leave. Look at all that cheddar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, humanity sucks! God, I'm a waste of a good actor! He's given three months as the Na'vi show him all the secrets of their ways, and... Yeah, this stuff is still pretty cool. This is what people got into the most. They said this film was great at world building and making you believe you travel to a new realm. While these scenes are very beautiful, I have a theory. I don't think it's the world that drew people in, I think it's the look. Avatar is visually amazing, the colors and creatures are beautifully designed, but I don't think it's an example of good world building. In my opinion, good world building should be innovative in either environment, character, or both. It should leave you wanting to know more about how the world works. There's a show called Upload about a digital afterlife that makes you want to walk through this world and see how everything functions. But the characters are kind of cookie cutter. Then you have something like Into the Spider-Verse. The environment isn't anything new, but the variation of characters based on the same premise, being bitten by a spider and turning into a hero, makes you want to see more of how each universe they're from created these people. An example on how the characters create the world building. Then you have things like Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, or, funny enough, Avatar, that are rich in unique characters and unique environments. By the way, I love that comes up first on IMDb if you search it. And you know why? More people are interested. I want to know more about how Aang, as well as the world he inhabits, operates. Both are filled with engaging possibilities and ideas. What ideas does Avatar offer exactly? 
Well, their literal connection to Pandora is kind of interesting. There's energy their hair can plug into with the animals and even the planet itself, lighting up as they get closer to the main energy source in this giant tree. I'll even say the floating mountains. Both of these take from existing ideas and add new elements to them. But there's a difference between adding to an environment and just copying it. What are those? They're horses. What are these? They're dogs. They even have the exact same call as a hyena. <laughs> what are the Navi? Every tribe ever shown on film. They focus on their connection to the environment, spirits, gods, and think our ways veer too far from them. Even their language sounds like a bad imitation of Native Americans from old westerns. <laughs> Latoya, Tito, Germain. I have to admit, I didn't think I'd be referencing Hot Shots this much. I feel like it's not creating something new, rather painting over something that's old. How cool would it be if the Navi had ten arms? A language that sounded like a gargling hippo and were born from a giant Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I don't know, I'm just saying this off the top of my head. I already want to know more about how that world works. But here, I bet their version of a lemur is similar to our version of a lemur. I bet their flying lizards are similar to our flying lizards. Even when they go to other tribes, they all look the same. I can tell the difference between every army in Return of the King. But which tribe is this guy from? I have no idea. But okay, they're focusing on allegory. That's fine. A lot of great world building has done that before. But once again, those examples tap into character archetypes rather than just copying them. There's a difference between a Lieutenant Dunbar type and Lieutenant Dunbar exactly. Nothing new is added to these character cutouts that were not only old 20 years ago, but also used in children's media. And even they did it pretty lame. Because of this, I admire Avatar for its visual design, not its world building. But you gotta give credit. Having a giant robot suit hold a giant gun instead of just having a gun already in the suit? That's just being smart. Hey, Doug Walker here, so we're doing something a little different for our middle of the review video. We've been asked to raise awareness of something that's vitally important during this pandemic. With everything going on in the world, it's more important than ever to take care of one another. Whether it's a friend you see every day or a family member you don't see enough. We can all feel isolated or overwhelmed during this crisis. So check up on your friends, check up on your loved ones, but also check up on yourself. Give a call, reach out, offer support, and get their support in return. We want to remind you that if you need support, you can always reach out to NAMI, the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization, to get support for yourself, but also learn how to support others. We're kind of tying this into the charity shout out as well, because we do so much believe in the importance of mental health, and even before the pandemic, your mental health is so important and should be treated seriously. Everybody's going through a lot, so don't be afraid. If you need support, please go to either NAMI.org or call 1-800-950-NAMI. You are not alone. If you need help, please take a look. So after Jake kills an animal while giving the proper Navi thanks... Yeah, can you just kill me? I'm in a lot of pain. You're welcome, asshole. This means nothing to me! Natiri decides he's ready to ride one of their flying banshees to become a true warrior. <laughs> What every studio says when Cameron goes over budget. He, of course, makes the bond and is taken to the Tree of Souls. The Tree of Souls. It's their most sacred place. You know, I'm finding I rarely like movies that have a tree of something. Unless it's a tree of death, mayhem, or chocolate, I'll usually pass. <laughs> but it looks like they're chased by a dangerous animal called Turok, who has chosen only five writers in all of the years the Navi have existed. My grandfather's grandfather was Toruk Makto. Toruk chose him. He brought the clans together in a time of great sorrow. Well, I've only been here three months. I'm sure I can be a better Navi than the actual Navi are. This is a place for prayers to be heard and sometimes answered. Well, I'm gonna pray I can bang you despite being betrothed to someone else. When you wish upon a star system! Just a heads up, Cinema Snop has already reviewed a Smurf's porno. It's as messy as it sounds. But they're awoken to an unpleasant sound. Jake! <sighs> Ready for round two? What the fuck? <laughs> it 
it looks like big bad humanity has started the demolition, so Jake and the others try to explain how they're ripping off Atlantis, the Lost Empire, as well. There's some kind of electrochemical communication between the roots of the trees. It's a global network, and the Navi can access it. The crystal is alive. They're deity. It's their power source. They're a part of it. It's a part of them. Oh, come on. We bomb with the same story, and you break box office records. Eh, who cares? We own you now anyway. We're gonna own everything. They can upload and download data. What the hell have you people been smoking out there? <laughs> I mean, you think I spent millions of dollars in your department to actually listen to you? Pfft, I'm just like burning money. Look! I do the same thing when I finance an Emmerich movie. To make things worse, Jake recorded that the Na'vi would never leave and it was pointless to have him out there. They're not gonna make a deal. There's nothing that we have that they want. Everything they sent me out here to do is a waste of time. I suppose someone could check my log whenever they wanted, but with these guys, they seem on the level. The demolition heads for the giant tree as Jake tries to warn them, leading to another timeless cliche that's always celebrated, the liar revealed. You knew this would happen? Everything changed. Okay, I fell in love. Trusted you! Please, no, no, please! No. You're not a prince, warrior, family member, gay, or celebrity singer? I am instantly dismissing anything you say, even if it'll help us, Owen Wilson. I mean, Jake. <laughs> they, of course, don't listen to them, and hey, we're being attacked. Someone should have warned us. <laughs> they take down the tree with their missiles and southern sayings. Right in the front door. I got you, Nace. All right, let's turn up the heat, and that's how you scatter the roaches. I, need, I say I need a porter, and that dog's got just a head for it. Leading to easily my favorite laughable cliche in the movie, and I know it's yours too, Sipping the coffee while people burn. How can you not burst with laughter at that scene? It is the ultimate villain cliche. All that's missing is a line like, oh, I love the smell of burnt gonzo in the morning. I'm finishing my coffee. Enjoying my coffee. Yes, Finger. It's time for you to wave in full swing. You! You! All of this is because of you! I know you think it isn't, but it is! It's because of you! See that tree falling? It's you! It's because of you! Thank God we're here as the enlightened path to show you that it's you. Even the chief has fallen. Oh no, not him. You know, I can't imagine how I would feel if any of the Sioux from Dances with Wolves died. Kicking bird, wind in his hair, stands with a fist. I have to struggle to remember any of these characters' names. Yeah, who is that? I don't know, I just call him Chuck. Chuck's dead, everybody. Poor Chuck. Dry your eyes. Chuck! I was a warrior who dreamed he could bring peace. Sooner or later, though, you always have to wake up. Wouldn't a thermos make more sense? I mean, if you're going to a battle with heavy fire, it's gonna spill in a cup. No, oh, I mean, uh, the poor Navi! Oh my god, I got to know him so well! Uh. The tree is knocked down, Jake and his friends are thrown in the brig, and even a pilot, played by Michelle Rodriguez, disobeys orders and flies away. No doubt being thrown in the brig with him, or she's fine. Personally, I don't feel these tree-hugging traitors deserve steak. They get steak? That's bullshit. Hey, heard you disobeyed a direct order. I think I'm supposed to slap you on the wrist or something. Let me check protocol. Oh, I was wondering why a pilot was serving food. Stay here. I need someone on the inside I can trust. And thankfully, there's no security cameras in this technologically advanced base. Best fucking picture! Let's go! Let's go, go! Weaver is shot, though, leading to another great corny as hell line. This is gonna ruin my whole day. Yeah, I wanted those to be my last words in Alien 3, but even they weren't crazy enough to put it in. I'm gonna give you some help, Grace. I'm a scientist, remember? I don't believe in fairy tales. Well, too bad, you're in three of them. Outcast, betrayer, alien. Okay, yeah, by this point, everybody figured out all your monologues are is this. You're not the Shakespearean soliloquy you think you are. Taruk is the baddest cat in the sky, so why would he ever look up? Jake believes he's the one to bond with Taruk. Again, three months, and he's so much more Navi than the Navi. And he wins over the tribe's respect once more. They try saving Weaver by... generating holy shits, I don't know. But it doesn't work and she passes away. She is with Ewa now. 
Is that a goddess? No, A1 steak sauce. We're gonna eat her in a moment. Grab a plate. You ride out as fast as the wind can carry you. You tell the other clans to come. So Jake encourages them to reach out to the other tribes. Oh wait, are we supposed to see this guy's evil? I totally missed that. Better hammer it in more. Now the hostiles believe that this mountain stronghold of theirs is protected by their deity. <laughs> That's as crazy as believing in life on other planets. They won't come within a thousand clicks of this place ever again. Yeah. Now do the chant with me! We're not wrong! We're not wrong! They all set out, getting ready to attack. I want this mission high and tight. I want to be home for dinner. And where is my evil coffee? Thank you! Wow, those are the most silent, clunky metal giants I've ever seen in war! Remember when the power loader sounded like delicate high heels? And shit on them! The Navi attack and... Once again, this is a visually pleasing action sequence. It's not like Cameron has ever done a bad action sequence, and this one is a lot of fun. Though once again, the reasoning behind some of the fights is pretty lame. Like when the goddess A1, that is to say, the planet itself, joins the battle. Yeah, sorry I, like, let so many of you get wiped out over the years. <laughs> Please accept my apologies with me brainwashing more innocent life to sacrifice themselves to the slaughter. Best deity ever! <laughs> it's Sully. Oh, hey, I remember that move from True Lies. Nice! <laughs> Lang is so tough, he treats his arm on fire as a mild annoyance. Eh, what do I care? I got another one! and leaps out of a crashing ship in his robot suit despite it would clearly turn his bones into pudding. He looks in his rearview mirror. Yeah, this film is swimming in radars, yet he uses a mirror. And Natiri tries to stop him killing Jake's human form. Ah! Hey, weird question. How come they don't have avatars for human beings? Like, make a human being avatar to go fight your battle so that nobody gets hurt? Oh, because no avatar would be clever enough to use a giant robot knife. Only a real human on the battlefield would want to be Robot Jock's Bayou Billy. <laughs> Please tell me while he watches this thing die, he drinks a giant robotic cup of coffee. I need this to be a thing. But Jake arrives and doesn't do much better. Atiri gets the final shot, though. <laughs> God, I hope that's the image they use when they won Best Picture at the Golden Globes. Avatar. And she saves Jake. Those crazy humans are sent back to Earth like kids being grounded to their rooms. And Jake uses the Tree of Souls to transfer forever into his Navi form. And that was Avatar. Over ten years later, you still know what's wrong with it and you still don't care. But maybe I can see why. Avatar is not a good movie, but it is a good experience. I think there's a reason its opening weekend was just okay for a movie of that size, but the following weeks it kept pulling people in, and why it's not watched or talked about as much on video. It truly was a big screen spectacle. But on top of that, it did have a big impact on cinema, just not in the way movies usually do. Most films like to ride the fads of story ideas or character traits, but Avatar was already ripped off of dated sources, so they took the technical inspiration. For example, the best 3D films know to be bright and colorful, as 3D requires more light that reflects better off of color. They also figured how to keep the main subject centered without it feeling too gimmicky like the old days. I get the feeling we wouldn't have 3D as amazing in films like Hugo or How to Train Your Dragon if it wasn't for Avatar. In fact, I thought the 3D in those films was even better than Avatar. But we still have this film to thank for that. Despite 3D not really being used as much anymore, it did invite talented filmmakers to push it to new levels. The filters they created to amp up the color is also a common practice now in modern film. So you can go from how it's originally shot like this, to this. Films at that time weren't nearly as colorful. If anything, they were much more grainy and colorless. Now it almost feels like films are as colorful as they've ever been. 
I remember having a fear that more movies were going to be like this, recycling obvious messages from after-school specials. I thought people hated this wagging finger style of storytelling, and I thought we just guaranteed we were gonna see a lot more of it. But this type of writing never became popular again. At least not on a grand scale like with Avatar. Everybody tried to imitate Star Wars when it came out, but not really with Avatar. At least in terms of story and characters. It really was just the look and the 3D that captured people's imagination, and that's what they tried to replicate. And that look has also led to new breakthroughs. Not only is the world of Pandora a marvel at Disney theme parks, but it's pushing the boundaries of what can be done in animatronics. I look forward to seeing you on Pandora. Well, not te came. Is that okay? How fucking crazy is that? So yeah, when this movie came out, I hated it. I thought the story and characters were how the future of movies were gonna be, but it seems like only the good stuff was taken from Avatar and improved on. So looking back, I can enjoy the impact it had, and enjoy the strong elements even more because of it. Whether you love it, hate it, or somewhere in between, Avatar made a big difference in the way that matters most. The best way. I'm a nostalgia critic, I remember, so you don't have to. Do you love film music? Do you want to feel deep, but not from subtle good movies, but rather from ones where shit blows up? Are you living between the years of 2000 and 2010? Then do we have the perfect soundtrack for you. It's One Woman Wailing. All of your favorite classics are here, like Ah! from Avatar. As well as Ah Ya 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 Hey! from District 9. Who can forget Ooh No Ya from Gladiator? Oh, no, yeah. And of course, Mmm Ya Ha from The Passion. Mm, yeah. We know you're sick of that one track from Platoon being played over and over. You want something new that can be easily duplicated and manipulative. Is it a foreign language or complete gibberish? Who cares? You can act like that pretentious action movie is more important than it is because you know there's a woman screaming and crying on the soundtrack, so now it's art. Whether it's Hulk, Crash, or even Matrix Revolutions, One Woman Wailing will always be there to make sure you won't sleep soundly. One Woman Wailing. It means something, I think. Olympic science majors.